Mars? No, it's better to colonize the moon first. No matter how advanced our civilization is, sooner or later it will have to deal with a problem that is not easy to solve, which is that of our planet's finite resources. And I'm not referring to resources such as minerals, clean water, and breathable air, but to something even more fundamental and restrictive, the amount of space available. There is, in fact, only a finite amount of land to inhabit on our planet. Yeah, sure, maybe someday we will build floating cities on the oceans or even manage to live in the deep sea, but it's only a matter of time. Sooner or later, some part of us will have to leave the planet. Okay, but to go where? Useless for the moment to think about the romantic idea of searching for an extrasolar planet, perfect and already nice and ready to live on. The distances are prohibitive, and our technological resources are pathetically insufficient for such a mission. Therefore, if we want a world suitable for our life, it seems that our only option will be to transform a currently uninhabitable planet into one on which humans can survive. And this has a name, and it's called terraforming. A world that in the collective imagination evokes one thing, Mars. But despite the belief of many that Mars is the right world to terraform within our solar system, there may be an even better option close to home, the Moon. And I'll explain why. Everyone wants to go to Mars. At first glance, it might seem that Mars is much more suitable for terraforming and colonization than the Moon. After all, there are already large amounts of water on Mars, both in the solid and gas phase. Or so it is said, although I personally fear that the predictions in this regard are too optimistic. Mars is also larger and more massive than the Moon. It has twice the gravitational force of the Moon, and its atmosphere, though rarefied, is rich in carbon dioxide, all of which are judged favorably compared to what the Moon can offer. But Mars not only has its merits, it also has a great many flaws. Here are a few. For one thing, it is farther from the Sun than Earth is, which means that its surface receives on average only 40% of what we receive here. And that's without considering dust storms, which on the red planet can block solar radiation for very long periods, sometimes up to several weeks or even months. And less solar power means that when we are there, we will have to provide for supplementing it with artificial sources of light and heat. And that will mean heavy technology, machinery, and installations to be moved hundreds of millions of miles away. Mars does not have a protective magnetic field like Earth and is therefore subject to bombardment by solar wind particles. Living on the surface would mean receiving a lethal dose of radiation on time scales far, far smaller than human life, resulting in the need to have to move underground, perhaps to one of those large lava tubes that apparently run through the red planet's subsurface in large numbers. In fairness, this is a problem that affects the moon as well. Another major problem is that of the soil. Martian soil is in fact very different from Earth's, with silicon dioxide combined with highly oxidized metals such as iron oxide, aluminum oxide, calcium oxide, and sulfur oxide. An extremely hostile soil, with a particular chemistry that is actually very unfavorable for the presence of organic compounds and the cultivation of plants. Mars is so far from Earth that at the speed of light, one-way communications can take 7 to 22 minutes to reach their destination a very long time if you have to direct any operation from Earth in real time. Then there are also the risks to human life to consider. A one-way trip to the Moon takes only a few days, as in the Apollo era. A spacecraft takes only three days to make a journey of about 400,000 kilometers. So if an emergency were to occur, astronauts could easily return to Earth. Mars, on the other hand, is hundreds of millions of kilometers from Earth, a thousand times the distance from the Moon which means it would take six to eight months for a manned mission to reach the red planet. If there were an emergency on Mars, the team might simply not return home, not to mention the enormously higher costs of transferring materials. Of course, none of these problems is an insurmountable obstacle. With a sufficiently high investment of resources, virtually anything is possible, even going to put bases on Pluto. But the more resources you have to bring with you, both to survive and thrive in the new environment and to protect yourself from the damaging effects of everything around you, the more difficult your mission becomes. 
Hang on a sec, guys, before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell. You will help us to make products of even higher quality. Okay, but what about the moon? Well, in terms of infrastructure and accessibility, there really is no competition. The telecommunications delay is 1.2 seconds and does not prevent normal voice and video conversations. This could be crucial in the early stages of founding the colony where emergencies and critical situations could use assistance from Earth in near real time. On the near face of the Moon, Earth appears large and always visible, while on Mars, when it is visible, it appears as a star. The crew of a lunar colony would feel psychologically less distant from Earth. A lunar base would be an excellent site for an astronomical observatory. Given the Moon's slow rotation, observations in visible light could last for entire days, it would also be possible to keep a target under constant observation through a series of observatories distributed around the lunar circumference. A radio telescope on the Moon could be much larger than the one at Arecibo because of the low gravity. In addition, the Moon is geologically dead. This, combined with the absence of widespread human activity, makes mechanical vibration disturbances almost absent and therefore interferometry telescopes more efficient. Finally, it should be borne in mind that rich deposits of minerals rare on Earth, such as titanium, gold, palladium, iridium, and uranium, but also common minerals such as iron, nickel, and aluminum, could be discovered on the Moon, since on its surface many meteorites, asteroid clusters, or comets known to be abundant in these minerals arrive almost intact due to the absence of atmosphere on the lunar expanse. Considering also that helium-3 has been found on the Moon, which could be used by nuclear fusion power plants, it would extend the capabilities of supplying both Earth and the Moon with energy for lunar cities and or bases. On the Moon, there is no atmosphere, no clouds or sandstorms that can filter or block solar radiation. You can install a solar panel on the surface and receive the same amount of incident radiation as you would from an orbiter and would only need to clean the panels every few decades. A lunar base will need efficient means to transport people and goods between Earth and the Moon and later between the Moon and other destinations in interplanetary space. One advantage of our satellite is its relatively weak gravitational field, which makes it easy to launch objects to Earth and other destinations. Sending materials from Earth directly to Mars, on the other hand, would have exorbitant costs. But by far the Moon's best resource is something that takes us back to the past rather than to the future. As we have already seen, the Martian soil, which is full of oxides, is not suitable for growing the plants needed for the food supply of the early colonies. In terms of the elements of which both worlds are composed, chemical compositions of the compounds we find and isotopic ratios of the materials present, however, the Moon and Earth have a common history. Except for the biological components found in Earth's soil, the composition of lunar regolith is identical to the composition of Earth's crust. And if the material present on the Moon is not only similar but identical to the material we have on Earth, this makes the prospect of terraforming the Moon a much easier task than we might otherwise have considered. Simply crushing lunar rocks to produce soil will be enough to begin the process of lunar agriculture. And this was demonstrated rather recently by an experiment done by sowing seeds of Arabidopsis phalania, a plant of no particular argonomic importance, but which precisely because of its simplicity is often used as a model organism in many scientific experiments, in regolith from the Apollo 11, 12, and 17 missions. The small amount of lunar soil available, not to mention its incalculable historical and scientific significance, meant that the planned experiment had to be conducted on a small scale and constantly filmed and monitored. The regolith was placed in small containers the size of a plastic thimble normally used for cell culture. Each well served as a jar and contained about one gram of regolith. Just as they do when they want to grow something on Earth, the scientists moistened the soil with a nutrient solution and added some Arabidopsis seeds. As a comparison, some seeds were also planted in Earth-derived soil, but mimicking real lunar soil in simulated Martian and terrestrial soil from extreme environments. The result? Well, almost all of the samples produce seedlings, thereby demonstrating the possibility of nurturing a lunar colony just by growing large quantities of plant products in a greenhouse. 
In short, if our goal is to colonize and then terraform the most suitable planets in the solar system, we absolutely cannot do without first definitively setting foot on the moon. And that is what we would probably do even if we were to, out of sheer display of our capabilities, first attempt to land on Mars. I am sure that a trip to the Red Planet would remain unique for quite some time, because we would immediately return to the wiser course, which is that of a quiet and comfortable colonization of our satellite. After all, we would only need to proceed via sequential and modular steps, with a repetitive pattern that over time would become a proven routine pressurizing domes or even lava tubes, implanting large greenhouses, calmly building the necessary infrastructure to connect the first small communities, securing the production of an increasing amount of energy, solar or nuclear, one tile after another without haste but methodically. And then one day when we feel strong and now adapted to extreme environments, we can finally use the moon as a springboard towards colonizing the solar system, always very slowly. Moon first. Take it from me.